thank you. Thank you very much all for coming to this event tonight. Can you hear me? Yes? OK. This is going to be a fun and uh, interesting learning experience for all of us. Uh, you know, it's pretty amazing how involved an event like this and how much work it takes to put it together. Something simple as this. Uh, I want to acknowledge some of the people who are who were instrumental in setting this up. Uh, first of all, Carlos Camargo, who is associated with this beautiful hotel. Hello, Carlos. Um, also, my son, Tony Gavilanes, who is doing all of the audiovisual here tonight. And um, also, Mark Calleros and uh, Victoria Olcott, who should be around here somewhere. I don't see them. Hello? OK. Oh, there you are. OK. Um, Melinda Rabin is uh, event coordinator for the uh, Seattle Latino Film Festival. She's uh, instrumental in this event taking place. We're very thankful to her for her efforts. And it's not been all just hard work and sleepless nights. It's been fun. We always have fun with this group. We party. And uh, that's mainly why I'm with a group, as a matter of fact. The um, people who are members of the Seattle Latino Film Festival have made it possible for us to be in this beautiful hotel. And not only that, but we are, they're offering us a really wonderful treat at the conclusion of this program, which are some hors d'oeuvres, as I understand, correct? They were. Oh, OK. I didn't take any of them. So you all enjoy them beforehand. That's OK. Did you leave any for me? OK. Um, I hope that you enjoy them. The Seattle Latino Film Festival uh, is a nonprofit organization uh, which has had six successful seasons in uh, the Seattle area under the uh, direction of Jorge Enrique Gonzalez. Uh, I have invited him to say a few words here in a, in a few minutes. Um, the uh, mission of the uh, festival is to support uh, filmmaking as part of Hispanic culture and heritage, and uh, to celebrate the art and talent of uh, Latin American cinema. Uh, in past years, the festival has brought together um, famous movie actors and celebrities, directors, uh, award-winning um, directors, uh, together with audiences locally. And the, the film festival has presented a number of very interesting films here, uh, all for the benefit of the of audiences in the Seattle area. The program, really, you're in for a treat tonight. First of all, we're very lucky to have Enrique Serna. Where are you, Enrique? Oh, there you are. I'm sorry. Uh, who is going to be um, MC in the event tonight? Uh, we have, um, as you know, he is um, KCTS TV, uh, Channel 9 anchor, and a distinguished journalist in his own right. He has agreed to be MC for, for this evening. Second, we will be viewing, and he will introduce, by the way, Carlos and Jorge Enrique, who is present here. Second, we will be viewing a short film called Running Wild, Hate and Immigration in Long Island. This is a short film, about 30 minutes long, and uh, it was uh, uh, made by a couple of uh, graduate students at Columbia University. Um, by coincidence, this is the same university where Mirta Ojito, our very distinguished guest, is a faculty member. She is a professor in the School of Journalism there. The film describes the environment of distrust and uh, suspicion and intolerance that was prevalent in the uh, town called Pachogi in, um, in New York, where these terrible events took place, culminating in the death of um, Marcelo Lucero, a 37-year-old Ecuadorian immigrant who had been here for about 17 years. Um, as I understand it, this film was the inspiration for Mirta Ojito to actually write this book. Um, which she is going to be discussing tonight. We are very fortunate to have her here. 
she's traveled 3,000 miles to be present, to discuss her book, to answer questions. And uh, when uh, our Master of Ceremonies, Enrique Serna, introduces her, he will be taking questions from the audience and Mirta will be answering them for you in a question and answer uh, segment to this program. I was fortunate to be present yesterday um, at an event at the Seattle Times sponsored by the World Affairs Council. And um, Mirta spoke about her arrival in this country. It's, it's a, a very compelling and very interesting story. Uh, you will hopefully hear a little bit about that tonight as well. Um, I found Mirta to be intelligent, articulate, and compassionate, and I hope that you will too. Um, someone was telling me about a friend, about a friend of his, who he had come to this country as a young man with $500 in his pocket. And after a period of time, he had become a multimillionaire. And I said, aha, uh -huh. when I came to this country, and I now know why I am not a multimillionaire. I only had $250 in my pocket. Now, not many of us come to this country with those kinds of aspirations um, in, in any event. Uh, but the question is, why do people come to the United States? The real reason why the vast majority of immigrants come here is because of poverty, is because of lack of opportunities elsewhere, is because of unemployment, is because of the unbelievable anarchy, violence, crime that exists in many, many parts of the world. The vast majority of people who are amongst the 11 to 12 million undocumented workers in this country are people who were motivated to better their lives, to come here and to find better opportunities to do better for themselves and for their families. Now, this is a country that has given to many, many of us refuge, opportunity, friendship. But in some cases, such as in the case of Marcelo Lucero, who is the principal character in the book of uh, Mirta Ojito, far from, from finding these qualities, this man found instead rejection, violence, and death. And so the questions that we must ask ourselves is how can it be that in this country, so full of opportunity, we can have a situation develop to this extent? So Mirta will address those issues. She might not have all of the answers to these questions, but her book and her comments tonight will give us an insight into the circumstances that give rise to the, that kind of violence that would take the life of an innocent man. Like Marcelo Lucero, I also came from Ecuador many years ago. Our distinguished uh, lecturer tonight, um, Mirta Ojito, is also a person who came from a foreign country. She came from the country of Cuba, I, I believe at the age of 17. So she speaks from a point of uh, authority and from knowledge. Um, I hope that by the time that this uh, event concludes that you will have uh, a heightened understanding of the problem. Maybe not the answers to all the questions for why the violence, but I hope that you will all benefit as I have benefited from getting to know such a distinguished uh, journalist. And at this point, I would like to present our distinguished other journalist, Enrique Serna. Thank you very much. Do you want to come up? All right. Carlos, come on up here. Um, first of all, we want to say thank you for uh, the hospitality that the hotel is uh, providing us. And would you like to say a few words there? Short and sweet. <laughs> All right, this is short, short and sweet. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's a great honor to be here. And this night, this sincerely could not have happened without uh, everyone that is a part of the Seattle Latino Film Festival team. Uh, Melinda, she is such a hard worker. She made all this happen for sure. Uh, Jorge, his passion is incredible. Uh, Tony, he's just such an expert at uh, putting on events like this. So, so yeah, I should not be credited with anything. Except for maybe the suit, because <laughs> I had to go home for that. <laughs> All righty, so hello and welcome to an evening with Pulitzer Prize winning author and decorated journalist, Mirta Ojito. Mirta, we are grateful that you have taken the time out of, your, out of your busy schedule to bring us your outstanding story to our beloved Pacific Northwest. We are also very grateful to our generous sponsors uh, at the Alexis Hotel, the Bookstore Bar and Cafe, and the Kimden Corporation for their luxurious generosity. Uh, I'd also like to thank on behalf of the uh, coordination committee and the wonderful work of, of techni technical events production that has made tonight a possibility. That's Tony right here. Uh, yeah, he's a man. He looks good with that hair. It's just ridiculous. He pulls that off. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. Uh-uh. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I sincerely want to thank uh, the general manager, Jenny Neptune. She's not here right now, but if she, if she were, she'd be going crazy. Um, and uh, executive chef Christopher Lovkovich that donated the, uh, the hors d'oeuvres at the beginning of this. I know that not everybody got one, but, uh, but if you really want to taste some of his food, the bookstore, bar, and cafe is the place to go. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, general manager uh, Christopher Givens uh, for his genuine uh, interest and support in the Latino community. Uh, and as an immigrant, it is a universally accepted truth that life is composed of inevitable challenges. Despite the age of, of, or background one may have during time of crossing, the trek to a better life is equally difficult for all of us. One inevitable challenge we must all face at one point or another is racism uh, and violence. Not, you know, not to be negative, but uh, even, even, in, even in grade school, I recall being uh, marginalized and alienated for not speaking the English language. Uh, or following the American customs, which I still don't really. But um, but today, uh, it's the challenges that, that I face and that my parents have faced, that all, everyone that is an immigrant, that these challenges that we face are what makes us a vibrant people, uh, you know, people that is uh, passionate about the arts and culture. Uh, we're just really great all together, but we could have only become this. <laughs> we could have only been this, this way because of the challenges that we face, and Mirta definitely uh, understands those challenges. So tonight we hold one individual as testimony to the all-American state of mind, uh, one woman that has taken the negativity and violence surrounding uh, the ongoing racism in this country uh, and made it into a standalone account of hope. We once again thank every single person that has found the value in being here tonight, you know who you are, uh, that supports the efforts of the modern Latino and Latina, as well as the artistic merits through film, music, and the written word. Uh, on behalf of Kimpton Hotels and Restaurants, as well as the Alexis Hotel, the Seattle Latino Film Festival, and the local uh, film community, uh, we thank you and hope you enjoy your evening with Mirta Ojito. Yes. And I want you to know that the suit looks great. Very nice. Okay. Well, um, let's get rolling into the documentary and so that we can... Uh, have uh, our conversation with our author tonight. So, roll them. Thank you very much. Well, we thank the filmmakers for that piece of work, which uh, was uh, very telling, I guess, about this community, but yet also uh, telling about the whole issue of immigration and how we still struggle with it today. Uh, very big pleasure now to be able to uh, introduce our speaker. Mirta, come on up. Come on over here. He's going to mic you up there. And as he does that, let me uh, tell folks about you. You're a newspaper reporter since 1987. She's worked for the Miami Herald, El Nuevo Herald. And from 1996 to 2002, the New York Times, where she covered immigration 
among other beats for the Metro desk. She has received numerous awards, including a shared Pulitzer Prize for national reporting in 2001 for her series in the Times about race in America. She is the author of Finding Manana, a memoir of a Cuban exodus. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and an assistant professor at the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University in New York City. And she's going to read a little bit, excerpts from uh, the book, um, and then we'll talk a bit more about uh, this incident that happened in uh, Long Island and how it has transpired since then. So, Mirta. Thank you very much, thank you. This feels a little weird, does that look good? With so many cameras. Okay. Well, I, um, I hadn't seen this documentary since I saw it for the first time in 2009, and um, so it's been a long time, and and it and it's great. And I probably should not be the one here. It should be Angel Canales and Tamara Bach. Um, Angel was a student of mine in the spring of 2009. Um, I teach a class at the journalism school at Columbia, which I'm teaching now this semester called um, Immigration Reporting. And there's a st former student of mine here, I think. Where are you? Coral, are you still here? She just stepped out, okay. All right, but um, so when, when I was teaching Angel, um, he was always very busy working on his master's project. All of our students have to do a major work of journalism uh, while they're in our one-year program, um, in print or documentary or radio piece or whatever it is, whatever your concentration happens to be. And Angel was a documentary student, and he was very busy, and that was the reason why he was taking my class, immigration reporting, because he wanted to learn how to report on immigrant communities. And... Um, you know, I was pretty hard on him. It's like, you know, you have to pay attention to my class, too. You're always rushing off to this documentary. So eventually, when he finished the documentary, he said, I really, really, really want you to come see what it is that I have been working on for so long. So I went to see it one Saturday morning at the J School, and this was it. And I was very, very impressed. I mean, clearly, this, this ran in PBS. I mean, this, these are students. They were just, this was their master's project. Um, so I was very proud of him and very impressed. But also I thought, I, I can add to this. There's, there's a lot more to this story that, that I think I can contribute to. He did, by the way, there have been several documentaries. This was the first, and in my opinion, the best, which is why I, su I suggested that, that you see this one tonight. But um, there are several. There are like three or four documentaries about this case. But anyway, before I read, I want to thank everyone for bringing me um, from New York. Everyone keeps thanking me for being here, but I have to tell you that you've been incredibly generous, all of you, the Seattle Latino Film Festival, and Jorge Enrique, and Carlos, and Melinda, and everyone. The hotel is fabulous. I'm having a great, great time in your beautiful, clean, and polite city. <laughs> With, uh, the children. <laughs> I might, to my boys are here, and we keep looking at each other and saying, people are so nice. Why are they so nice to us? We're becoming a little suspicious. <laughs> it's like, are they following us? It's like, what's going on here? But it's like, really, I mean, it's been really, we've only been here for like two days, but one full day today out, um, out and about, and it's just been really extraordinary. So let me tell you first why I thought that I could add to this. Um, a long time ago when I was a reporter in the New York Times, I came across a study that uh, two um, professors had put together about how immigrants were no longer going to the cities as they have traditionally done in the United States. The traditional path for immigrants was to come to a city, begin working, earn some money, and then move away, begin moving to nice and nice in areas in the cities until eventually they move to suburbia. That's kind of been the pattern for everyone, not just immigrants, but particularly for immigrants. And uh, what the sociologists came up with in the 90s, I think it was 1996 when I did this story, 
was that immigrants were no longer doing that. They were bypassing the cities and moving straight to suburbia. And they said this will going, was, is going to have consequences because the cities are ready and willing and they have the resources to, to take care of the needs of immigrants. If you think about what are the needs of immigrants when they arrive, they need to learn English right away, right? So they need free or very cheap uh, lessons in English. They need jobs, they need cheap housing, they need school for their kids, they need health care. They have a great variety of needs that the cities can deal with. They're used to it, at least in New York, they're used to it. They know how to do that. But when they go straight to suburbia, who moves to suburbia? Usually people who want to get away from the so-called urban issues, and that usually means us. Um, so they move to suburbia, um, behind the white picket fences and their great schools, and they really, really don't want to spend money in ESL classes, which in the state of New York is mandatory. You do, if you have a certain number of students who don't speak the language, you have to teach them. And so that becomes a huge issue. Um, and when I came across that study, I thought, well, that's interesting. And I went ahead and did a story then in 1996 of a town near New York, Nat Patchogue, um, uh, some other plays, and I thought I should follow up this at some point, but I never did. So when I saw this, when I saw what had happened in Patchog, I thought, this is what they were talking about. This, uh, this is the extreme consequence of the clash of cultures, if you will, in sort of unchecked, wild uh, suburbia, when people with great needs move in great numbers to a place that is not ready for them, it's not prepared for them, and really does not want them. That needs them to do the work, but is hoping that at the end of the day we'll go home elsewhere. What happened in Pacho was that Pacho became home. They stayed. And, uh, and basically when I say Pacho, I really mean Suffolk County, because in fact, this, this boys, none of the attackers lived in Patchogue, per se. They lived in Medford and other areas near Patchogue, but not in Patchogue. But they went to Patchogue that night, specifically looking for beaners, which is the name they used for Latinos um, or for Hispanic immigrants. So, so that's pretty much, I mean, that was, so one, of, that was one of the reasons. The other reason is because I am an immigrant myself, I came from Cuba in, the in 1980 in the Mariel boat lift, which is when more than 125,000 Cubans left the island um, in the span of five months aboard about 2,000 vessels and came to Key West. And um, that boat lift was so chaotic and some very bad people came in that boat lift. So we were soon saddled with the name Marielitos and with the reputation that all of us were as bad as few of us were. And so I knew, I think, a thing or two about living with a label. And though Marielito probably was not as bad as illegal, or maybe it's the other way around, depending on your perspective, I knew what it was like to live with a label. And I wanted to explore that um, and the consequences of that. And the third reason I was attracted to the story was because um, I am the mother of three Latino boys, three boys who were born, two of whom are here today, three boys who were born um, in the United States, and this is their home, but they are bilingual. And I've never told them, nor will I ever tell them, I hope. Um, be careful when you're out there, don't speak Spanish in public, on the contrary. I'm, I'm always telling them to speak Spanish. And they know the advantages, they have seen the advantages of knowing Spanish many, many times. So who were these people looking for? If I don't, you could see that Angel Sierra, who was the, the person who was attacked right before Marcelo Lucero, does not look at all like Marcelo Lucero, right? So there's not even a type. Um, Angel Sierra, I mean, um, Hector Sierra, not Angel. Hector Sierra did not get to speak. So it wasn't even an accent. They didn't ask him. They didn't ask for papers. Had they asked for papers, they would have seen that he was a US citizen. Hector Sierra is. So he's not even undocumented. So it's a very, it was a very confusing story for me, a very dangerous story. It made me feel that we were all at risk, including my children. And I wanted to explore that um, 
And I left, and I'm glad that you said that, I, that we may not walk away today with all the answers, because I don't have all the answers, even though I spent three years reporting um, this book. Um, spent a lot of time in Patchogue. The first time I went to Patchogue, I had never been to Patchogue. I didn't even know how to pronounce the name of the town. Didn't even know where it was. Um, Angel, my student, had to tell me. So the first time I went, I, I felt very, very strange taking the train out there and being in a place where this, the Latin, Latinos had been uh, continuously harassed. Marcelo Lucero was killed, but as you will see in the book, this was a sport for them. They called it hunting beaners. And it was a, 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 you know, an event that they did. Um, one of the boys, when they were arrested, they said that they, I said, I didn't do it that often, maybe once or twice a week. So this was a, something that they did continuously. And I felt very strange being in Patrick. I remember taking the train out there, walking around for about 10 minutes and coming back to the city. I felt I was suffocating. I just could not be there. I had to sort of train myself to spend time there. So then the next time I went, and I actually made it to Main Street, and I went to a restaurant, and I went to a library, and I felt very comfortable in the library. The library played a very important role in the story. It's not in the documentary, but it's very much in my book. It's a huge role. And so I'm glad I went to the library. And little by little until now, I have to be honest with you, I have friends there, and I have places where I eat. I actually like going. I've taken my children, um, and, and it's fine now for me. But it took me a while to get to that um, level of comfort. So I'm going to read to you, um, I don't know what I should read. Let's see. Um, I think because you saw him there, I'm going to read how Hector Sierra was attacked. Um, I think since you saw him, you'll be able to, to understand it better. This, this happened, uh, Marcelo Lucero was killed on November 8, 2008, and it was near midnight. Um, it was not a very cold night, but it was, uh, I think the moon was out, it was a little, there was some fog, and this, it's, it's suburbia, so the streets are quiet, not too many people out. And Hector Sierra was attacked just a few minutes before. The man the group had spotted was Hector Sierra, a 57-year-old waiter at Gallo Tropical, a popular Latin restaurant on Main Street owned by a Colombian family. He had come to the United States legally in 1973 and had lived in New Jersey, Queens, and Manhattan before settling in Patchogue, a place he thought was safe and quiet. A naturalized U.S. citizen, he had lived back and forth between Patchogue and his native Colombia for years. At the time, he had been working at Gallo Tropical for seven, year, for seven years and had risen to the position of head waiter. That day, he had started his shift at 10 a.m. and had worked until 11.30 p.m. to accumulate a little overtime. He was tired and decided to leave the restaurant through the back door to shave off a block from his seven-block walk home. It was foggy and dark in the streets, almost midnight, and Sierra walked fast. He had little on him, a watch, a cell phone, and a wallet with a few dollars, but he had heard about groups attacking Hispanic men in the streets, so he was cautious. He wore a baseball cap, put his hands in the pockets of his coat, and walked with his head down. Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed a reddish, perhaps brown SUV making a left turn and passing him slowly, as if whoever was in that car was watching him or knew him and wanted to stop and say hello. Sierra didn't know anybody who owned an SUV and walked faster. He couldn't tell how many people were in the car but heard voices and knew immediately that were anything, going to, ha were anything to happen, he would be outnumbered. The car stopped in front of a building. It was the only car around and the streets were deserted. Sierra heard a noise from inside the car, three or four popping sounds, one after the other. To him, it sounded like a small caliber gun. Then he saw four young men get out of the car, two from the right side and two from the left. They're young, he thought, very young. Still, there were four of them, and he was alone. Whoever was still inside the car kept the motor, motor running. Not a good sign. Then the four young men started running toward him. They were fast. 
Sierra recalled that a couple of his co-workers had been beaten up recently by youngsters. He was afraid the same was about to happen to him. He couldn't run forward. He couldn't stay in place. So he turned around and started running away as he would later testify like hell. It's weird, he would later recall, because as I was running away from them, you know, my mother passed away like a couple of months before that ordeal. And as I was running from them, I was praying to my mother's soul. I don't know, it was like a short movie. It runs through your mind so fast. And I was praying to my mother to take me away from these wolves because I didn't know them. I didn't know who they were. I didn't know what their purpose was. So it was very scary. The young man caught up with Sierra from behind. They punched him on the ears and kicked him. Afraid to get his face hurt, Sierra tried to keep his head down and didn't turn around to face them. He kept running despite the blows, but everything, but eventually tripped and fell. He ripped his pants and cut his knee. Eerily, the young men were quiet as they attacked him, never yelling or insulting or even asking for money as he had feared. Sierra stood up, afraid that if he stayed down, they would hurt him even more. He started moving in a zigzag way to avoid and confuse them. He got to a house where he thought his Hispanic residents lived, but he tripped again and the young men chasing him began to kick him from behind. Sierra dragged himself on the lawn, trying to reach the porch of the house. He was now yelling for help. He managed to reach the porch, but no one was coming to his aid. There were people up there and they never came out. They were afraid to open the doors or something. I felt so defenseless, so lonely. Desperate and trying to get away from the hard blows and relentless kicks, he started pounding on the windows. One cracked, but didn't break. He kicked the front door, hard. He was, somewhat he was somewhat embarrassed that he too had become an aggressor, but he felt he had no choice. The light of the porch went on, but the door remained closed. The light may have scared the attackers who backed up a few steps, enough time for Sierra to turn around and take a look at them. To him, they were simply white kids. Two were right behind him, two others were farther away, staring. The teenagers ran away toward the SUV and Sierra walked to the street to see where they were going. They got in the car quickly and made a left on Thorn Street. Sierra realized that although the attackers were gone, he was still screaming. His throat felt parched and raw, his mouth dry. A man in a car waiting for the light to change saw him and asked why he was screaming. Sierra finally realized the ordeal was over, but he was no longer alone. And he was no longer alone. He told the man what had happened and the man urged him to call 911. Sierra tried, but his phone wasn't working. It had been damaged in the attack. The man drove him to a nearby 7-Eleven, hoping to find a police car along the way, or maybe even, a parked, maybe even parked there. But the 7-Eleven was deserted. It was close to midnight, exhausted, in pain, and afraid. Sierra gave up trying to find a phone or a cop, and he walked home without telling anyone what had happened to him that night. If he had, if his phone had been working, if someone had called the police, if the Hispanics in the house with the porch and the light had offered help, perhaps a young man in the car would have given up on their evening entertainment and driven home. But no one stopped them. Soon after that, <clears throat> like two blocks away, they found Marcelo Lucero, who, by the way, was not alone. He was walking with his best friend from childhood, and um, his name was Angel Loja. And Angel Loja was attacked, but he was not killed. And he's still not in Patchogue, but he's still living in Suffolk County um, nearby. So I think the format calls for a question and answer. So I'm going to stop there and take questions. Thank you. <coughs> If you have questions, please raise your hand and I'll come to you and uh, put the microphone in front of your face. But I'm going to hold on to it. So um, let's start. I have a couple of questions sure. to ask first, and that is Jeffrey Conroy. Mm -hmm. He was uh, the person that stabbed Marcelo. Um, he ended up being convicted of manslaughter and mm -hmm. also, I believe, gang assault. Mm -hmm. uh, how many years in prison is he spent? 25. Spending? And what happened to the other young men? So the others, oh, the only one who went to trial was Jeffrey Conroy. The others um, pled guilty to a variety of charges, um, was sentenced to anywhere between, I, I believe, seven and 10 years, or maybe six and 10 years. It's in the book, but I don't remember now. But 
definitely the one who got the most was 10 years. You uh, wrote a letter to him. And I actually, did. he wrote a letter back to yes. you as well. Yeah, that was surprising. Tell me about that, and tell me about that letter as you were yeah. writing this. So I wrote a letter to all of them because by the time I came, I told you that I had seen the documentary in 2009, right? A year after it happened. And I really began, then I thought about it, but I began reporting the book really during the trial of, of Jeffrey Conroy, which was um, either January or February 2010. So by then, by the time I really got in the book, they were all um, in person. So I wrote a letter to all of them and to their lawyers. And um, some of them wrote back that they were not interested. Others completely ignored the letter. But Jeffrey was the only one of the seven boys, or the seven young men, who wrote back himself. And I'm going to read to you what I wrote here at the beginning of the book. It was a longer letter than this, but basically he said, um, well, I, read, I write here, from prison, Jeffrey Conroy wrote me a letter, which for more than a year I kept on my bulletin board next to the picture of a serious looking Lucero as a fourth grade student in Ecuador, his body partly blocking a map of North America. In his letter, dated July 16, 2011, Conroy wrote that he believed I would write a fair book and that my work would be balanced and respectful. Those are quotes. For more than three years, I have labored to live up to that expectation and to honor the stories of those in Patchogue and Wallaceo who opened their lives to my curiosity and scrutiny. And I found that, you know, I, I found interesting that he would write to me. But of course, the things that he asked for, which was, uh, balance, respect, and fairness is what all journalists strive to do. So it wasn't difficult for me to um, adhere to those principles because it's what I tried to do anyway. I was struck by uh, one of the young women that uh, talked in the documentary about um, racism and, and what we learn, where we learned that from, and she talked about the parents. Mm -hmm. You had conversations with his parents. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that and your impressions, which might have you know, had some impact on him for what he did or didn't. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, I had conversations with his father. Um, the mother was not in the picture at all after he was um, sentenced. So I had conversations with the father, and it's hard. It's hard because... You, I'm, I'm not, I came into their lives after something really, really horrific had happened. And I would imagine that he was very conscious that he was talking to someone who was writing a book about his, his, his son, and therefore whatever he said would reflect, could potentially reflect on his son. So having said that, I did not see anything in him and in my dealings with him that would in any way um, show that he was racist or that he had taught racism to his son. I think I give him a lot of credit for opening the door of his home to me many, many times. I interviewed him many times. He knew, obviously, that I'm Hispanic. Um, he knew that I'm an immigrant. And he was one of only two parents who spoke to me. Not only that, when he received a copy of the book, he sent me a text message that said, and I, this is a quote, I had no idea your book would be this good. There was a lot here that I did not know. Um, so I take my hat off for that because it is about his son and I'm not pulling any punches because I can't. I mean, his son killed a man, he confessed to it. Later he retracted, that's a long story and you will see it in the book, but the fact of the matter is that immediately after the crime he confessed to it and the fact of the matter is that he was convicted of it. Um, I was struck by the fact that one of these young men that was involved in this was Latino. He was half Puerto Rican, half right. black. Uh, but uh, these young men, why did they do this? Your sense of what? Right. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's complicated. I think that's like the $20,000 question. I think we may never know exactly why they did it. Um, but there are many parts, there are many elements. The first is that in, that in all the books that I read about hate crimes, I've read that um, 
in fact, when people commit, when you, well, let me play this in context. First of all, most of, hate, of the hate crimes are committed by young people, young men, and young men under the influence of something, drugs or alcohol, in this case both, right? And that mostly they're not motivated so much by hatred as they're motivated by um, um, thrills. They are thrill seekers. And they're acting, it's group behavior. So it's like gang behavior. So that's, that's out there. So the question really is, why is it that when they decide to go seeking thrills, they go after Hispanic immigrants and not someone else, right? And I think that has to do with the way they look at Hispanic immigrants, um, which is, I think, you know, as people who are less than, people who are less than they are, to a certain extent, uh, extent invisible, powerless, people who, um, when attacked, they basically took the blows and went home. Often they were afraid to go to the police because they were here undocumented, or sometimes they had been drinking and they would take the money from them and they would wake up kind of half drunk and not knowing what to do, would just go home. Or they would call the police and then the police would say, well, who were they? Well, I don't know, white kids. White kids, a lot of white kids. Like, how do you find them? And, you know, what am I going to do? If I go, you know, if they're young, they'll be out the next day. So there was a lack of um, for, for, um, follow-up. And this is not something I'm saying. The Justice Department said that. The Justice Department wrote a scathing letter to the Suffolk County Police Department in which basically they said, if you had been paying attention, if you had done something before, perhaps this wouldn't have happened. So there was that. I was struck in the documentary, I'm always struck by the comments of the people from the school, like the physical education or the coach saying, this happened out there in the community. This had nothing to do with us. Well, yes and no, because you will read in the book that, and, you, and, the, and they say it also in the documentary, what was happening in the high school was horrific, horrific. I mean, talk about, it was beyond bullying. It was incredibly abusive. And the, I want to believe, I mean, the most, the most, I guess the most, generous thing that I could say is that I like to believe that they didn't know it. But then if they didn't do it, they didn't know it, they weren't doing their jobs. Because you have to know these things. As educators, you have to know what's going on in your school. You have to. I mean, it, I'm, kids talk, kids tell you what's going on. So I am so, so surprised that no one I talked to in that community seemed to know that any of this was going on. And the people who did know learned very late, and this is the people in the library. They found out a few days before Marcelo Lucero was attacked, and the librarian, one of the librarians, Jean Calida, who's, who's also in the book, picked up the phone and called the mayor, Mayor Pontieri, who is the grandson of Italian immigrants, and said, you know, this, we, we need to talk. This has been going on. And he said, absolutely, we have to talk. Let's have a meeting Wednesday with the community. Call everybody, we're gonna have a meeting in the library. Wednesday. And Marcelo Lucero was killed that weekend before the meeting on Wednesday. So by the time they found out it was too late, but I, I'm struck by that, that they didn't know. I think I lost your question somewhere along the way. Well, it was a good answer. <laughs> it was answered? You can answer, let me, let me get uh, okay. some, go ahead. I would like to know how the uh, uh, the attitude of the country, you know, about Im immigrants reflecting all yes. these communities mm -hmm. and the behavior of the people. It's sometimes not at home, but it's just the Thank people. You. Okay, that's that's what I was going to get to. That was part of the answer. Yes. Yeah. So part of it is, part of it was that, and the other part is. So we're talking about the thrill seekers and how they saw them as less than. At the, on the other hand, we have a a country that has been, says that has been trying for a long time, for I'm thinking about 20 years, to, to get to some form of immigration reform because what we're going through now is not the first time, right? This has happened before. 
I remember certainly before 9-11, we were definitely going to, going to do something, and then 9-11 happened, and that was that. 2007 with Bush, we were trying to do something, and then it didn't happen, and then with Obama. So this has happened before. And I think that um, this sort of dual message that we have in this country in which we say, on the one hand, we really need you to work, but we don't want you here, or at least we don't want to legalize your status here. It's a very complicating thing, and it can be very confusing for young minds. Um, add to that the language we use to refer to undocumented, undocumented documented immigrants, for the most part in the media, until very recently, that AP changed its, its style, and I'm talking about months, um, illegal uh, uh, immigrant or illegal alien was a style. And I think that has a huge impact. I think that words matter tremendously. What we say with, to our kids at the breakfast table, at the lunch table, has an impact. But what they read in the newspaper and what and the media portrays also has an impact. If you watch the news, and I'm not really sure that it's still happening, but certainly at that time, and when I was reporting the book, I started paying attention and I noticed um, in television news, they, they kind of have to have flow, right? They try to have stories that go together, right? They don't, they, they don't have a sad story and immediately a happy story right after. They try to connect stories in some ways. Whenever they have a story about undocumented immigrants, invariably <clears throat> you see the same video. Somebody jumping over a fence or crawling through something. And then after that, if there was a drug bust somewhere, that comes after the story about the undocumented immigrants, even if the immigrants are involved or not. It's, it's like kind of dumped with the illegal stuff. So then, um, if you're already breaking the law, if you're already an illegal person, uh, it seems to me you're fair game, right? You're fair game. Then you shouldn't even be here anyway, so why shouldn't I attack you? I'm thinking that this is their mentality, right? Then add to that, that in Suffolk County, the leaders, the political leaders, the elected officials were vicious. I mean, the, the, the man, Levy, that he has in the documentary was incredibly vocal against immigrants and saying some things, you know, he talked about anchor babies, you know, women who would cross the border to have the children here so they would be U.S. citizens. Um, other elected officials talked about, if I had people like that in my community, I would be out with a gun or I would be out with a bat. I mean, really vicious, violent things against immigrants. Um, this has been going on in Suffolk County for a long time. So Jeffrey Conroy and his friends grew up in that environment. Uh, politically speaking, my name is Edgar Santiago from Guatemala. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm very proud to live in Washington State because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's a really great state uh, to live with. And they, uh, Washington seems to be creating programs all the time for, you know, immigrants. Good. You know, um, my question is, politically, have you seen any change there? Has, pol you know, uh, leaders of the state changed yes. their mind? Yes. And in Patchogue, yeah. In the county, uh, yes, Levy is gone from politics, and um, the new um, Suffolk County, um, what do they call it, manager, so I think it's manager, um, it's a completely different person. In his first speech, he talked about um, immigrants and how important they are for the county, and he's a compl completely different person. The tone has changed completely. And the mayor of, of, of Patchog, um, again, as I told you, he's a grandson of Italians. He's never been to Italy. He's never been to Calabria, which is where his family is from. But he has been to Wallaceo in Ecuador, which is where most of the Ecuadorians who live in Patchog are from, like maybe 99%. He visited Wallaceo. He was there for a few days in the summer of 2010. And when I asked him why, and he said, because I'm the mayor of all of them, and I want to know all of these people. I don't, I don't care whether or not they're citizens. I don't care where they come from. Their immigration status is beyond my pay grade. I, I really am the mayor of everyone here. 
So it, it is, in terms of tone, is different. What about Patrick today? What's it, what's it like, I guess, compared to the time? So I'm, I'm told, I was, I was not given access to the high school, but I am told that things have changed tremendously in the high school, that the students are more um, communicating with each other, that they're not as segregated as they were before. Um, I know that the library was selected as one of the top libraries um, in the country. They received an, uh, an important award from Michelle Obama in 2011, I believe it was. Um, they continue to have amazing programs for immigrants. Um, but having said that, Pontier is still the mayor. Having said that, um, as recent as early December, there was a rash of attacks against, again, immigrants by groups of young people, not in Patchogue, but on Long Island, 28 miles away. So, you know, when Jeffrey Conroy was sentenced to 25 years, Jose Lucero, the brother of Marcelo Lucero, walked drove and then walked to the place where his brother had bled to death 18 months earlier. And he said um, that the hunting season was over, which is why my book is called Hunting Season. But then he seemed to reconsider and then he said, but hate never really goes away. He's always looking for another place. And I think it's founded because this, this just happened in December. 28 miles away in Huntington Station. And nobody died, but it's exactly the same pattern. Groups of very young people, as young as 14, attacking immigrants, kind of for sport. So. Hold on, let me move over here. Thank you. Mirta, do you think that the um, anti-immigrant rhetoric um, of persons such as Levi, the, this character in your book, which was prevalent at that time, as well as um, writers such as Pat Buchanan, mm -hmm. and then this journalist with CNN, I forget his name. Hey. Lou Dobbs, who actually used to work here in Seattle. That's exactly right, we remember him from Seattle. Well, do you think that this rhetoric is now hopefully a thing of the past, or not yet in this country? I don't know. I don't know. I think it would be difficult to have that rhetoric again in Patchogue or in Suffolk County um, because the, the wound is too recent, too raw. I think it would be very difficult, but I mean, we had Arizona um, recently, right? And, you know, I, it's, I, I don't know what's going on in every community in the country, and maybe things go underreported, or maybe they're reported, I just don't read about it. Or maybe, which is what I worry about sometimes with reporters, maybe we are not paying attention. For example, and this is something that I tell my students all the time, I don't think we should make light or we should laugh at the things that Eddington was saying. When he was complaining about the soccer game and the volleyball games late into the night and how that was disruptive for the community and the babies and then Hernandez said there was always a baby. And I heard a few chuckles in the audience. But it's not time to roll your eyes and to chuckle because reporters ought to be paying attention to that. Those are the things that need to be talked about in communities, and they need to be aired out, because if you leave it there, if they fester, that's when you have problems. I don't remember reading stories about that out of Long Island, and I think people are too readily, too, too, too easily assume, oh, that's racism, I'm not gonna pay attention to it. But I think we need to pay attention. I think we need to hear what they say, and we need to report it out. For example, if people say, there's so much crime in this neighborhood. This used to be a very quiet neighborhood, and now that all these illegals moved in, crime has gone up. Well, is it true? Go to the police station, get the statistics. Is it true that there's more crime? More often than not, it's exactly the opposite, because undocumented immigrants do not want to attract attention to themselves. 
So they tend not to commit crimes. But if you write about it and you report it, and it's in the paper or it's in the news, then, then you're confronting them with the truth, right? So I think instead of ignoring these things, they ought to be talked about, but I think we ignore them. So I don't know if it's over. I, don't, um, I doubt it. I doubt that it is. I think it's kind of one town at a time, one place at a time. Um, and there are places that when these things happened, hopefully, I mean, I think, I think what happened in Pachog is that Marcelo Lucero became what they call an agent of change. I think the, ch the town will be changed, if not permanently, for a long time because of this. I don't know that the feelings have changed for everyone, but maybe they don't verbalize them. And that's okay. That's okay. As long as they don't verbalize them, I'm not, you know, I don't think you can change everyone's feelings overnight, but if people learn to at least control what they say, that's a step in the right direction, I think. After all this time and working on this, how has this affected you, but how does it continue to affect you? Well, I get sad every time I see it. And my youngest was not here. He left already. When he was watching the documentary, he approached me and he said, this is very sad. And I told him to, to step outside if he wanted to. I think it's a very sad thing. Um, so I think the way it, it, it affects me, it's not so much that it affects me, it impacts me. I want to do more of it. I, I want to continue reporting this story. I think it's not over. And I think, I, need, I think we need to do, I think we need to commit more resources and time to serious um, immigration journalism. I think that one of the problems we have in journalism, as you know, is that we have uh, suffered great losses, economic losses, so that newspapers have lost a lot of employees. And for some reason, foreign reporting goes first, and then immigration. It's one of the beats that people tend not to cover, so unless there is a crisis. And I think that if you cover immigration only when there is a crisis, it's too late. I think it requires a steady coverage, just like education reporting or just like the police beat. You have to have someone there paying attention. And, that, and, I, and, my, and that's, my, that's one of my goals in the journalism school. I'm working on that. I think there was a question here. One more. Um, my name is Enrique Aguilar, and sorry because my English is not very good, but try to understand me. I see the title, Hunting Season. Uh, I was kind of person when I was in the school. Uh, it's a small gang trying to kill me, and one of them, you know, because it's very normal in the teenagers' uh, boys, because sometimes we forgot, and as a humans, we are in the top of the hunters. And that is very often because the hunters, for trying to catch the press has to see the the, the weakest. Uh -huh. And that's his hunting season because we still, and you know, the immigrants, they know that they don't exist. Mm -hmm. And trying to, to see the, the weakness is not the same thing like the other. But, you know, it's interesting that, you know, hunting season because after, you know, thousands of years, we still be an animal, especially the young people and still wild. Yes. And I would love to read your book. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting, and, and I think, um, I, I did not think about that before until I saw Angel's documentary again. He called it running wild. There's an element of, of that, right, of the wilderness, if you will, in both the documentary and the book. Uh, the title really comes off uh, the, the idea that there were hunting beaners. That's what they called it, hunting beaners. And then that at the end, Jose Lucero said the hunting season it's over, but I, I don't think it is. And to make a comment that I had made um, earlier, I, this is not new in the United States, right? This is, first of all, it's not unique to Hispanics. It's happened to other groups. And in the case of Hispanics specifically, which is the one that I reported for the book, I can find the very, very first instance of discrimination against or hate crimes, I should say, not discrimination, against Hispanics that I found came during the gold rush, as a matter of fact, in California. 
And then the incidents pile up in the 20s and the 40s and the 60s. And then in California, again, in Prop Proposition 187. And so this is not, this was not an accident. This was not an aberration. This is part of a pattern and part of our history that is usually not discussed in class. We don't see it in the history books, and we don't see it in um, Latino exhibits. Certainly, I've never seen it in, in, a, in any museum uh, exhibit, for example, pictures or anything like that. But it's there if you want to read it. There are books about it. It's, it's very much part of our history in this country, and it's been systematic and ongoing. And one of the things that I found really um, strange about this process is that when I was sending my proposal out to different um, editors so, to, so that they would buy the book so I could write it, one rejected it, and she said, I don't like that she's making Marcelo Lucero out to be um, like the Matthew Shepard of Latinos. And you know who Matthew Shepard is? So he, and, and I had never thought of that. I had never, it had never occurred to me that Marcelo Lucero was the Matthew Shepard of Latinos. But after she said that, then I thought, well, and why not? Why don't Latinos have a Matthew Shepard? And I don't know why, but I found a case, and I don't know if you know about this case, I wrote it down here in my notes because I want to tell you about it. This is one of the most horrendous cases, most horrendous cases I have ever heard of. Let me just tell you that between 2004 and 2007, the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, details cases of angry young white men chasing Mexicans but settling for any Latino. Um, that have taken place in Tennessee, New Jersey, Georgia, Utah, Alabama, Louisiana, Kentucky, Maryland, Wyoming, Missouri, Nebraska, Florida, Washington, D.C., California, and Texas, between 2004 and 2007 only. And one of those cases took place at a party in a suburb um, of Houston, Texas, on April 22, 2006, when two young men attacked a Mexican-American boy. His name was David Richardson. He was 16. The attackers broke his jaw and knocked him unconscious while screaming white power and calling Richardson a speak and a wet back. They also burned him with cigarettes, kicked him with his steel-toed boots, attempted to carve a swastika into his chest, poured bleach on him, and finally sodomized him with a patio umbrella pole. It took 30 surgeries before Richardson, confined to a wheelchair and wearing a colostomy bag, was able to return to school. A year after the attack, he spoke at a hearing of the U.S. House of Representatives Judiciary Committee about strengthening federal hate crime laws. And less than three months later, Richardson committed suicide. He was 18. I'm curious, have any of you heard about that case before? Right. Everywhere I've gone, I have read this, and I have asked, and no one has heard. I had neither until I began re uh, reporting my book and researching hate crimes against Latino. He could have been Matthew Shepard, right? 16 years old. You should see his picture. You can just Google his name. Google his name, and you'll see. It's just a terrifying, absolutely terrifying story. Yes, you have a question. Are you done? Uh, so do you think that, is racism, uh, is it a cultural thing? Is it strictly a color thing? Because it feels like the, like the youth is starting to uh, shed the idea that color determines a person. And I know that, I know working with youth in the media, uh, a lot of them don't, don't classify themselves as Latino first or African American first or Asian American first. Do you think that that is? Uh, do you think that's a way of one day in the future, hopefully, erasing racism, or do you feel like it'll always be around because of a culture or because of? 
I have no idea. I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do know that I, I, I answered this question earlier today to someone else. I don't know a country that is not racist, frankly. This is not unique to the United States. We do it in our own countries, if you think about it. Um, uh, in fact, many of us have found in this country um, a country of laws and a protection in the judicial system against this sort of thing that we don't find in our own countries, right? The fact of the matter is that Jeffrey Conroy, it's in prison for you know, 25 years, and so are the others for less, fewer years, but they're in prison, and that they were caught immediately. So, so there is, you know, I, I do believe in the justice system in this country and, and in, the, in the fact that they are paying attention to these things and that it is not kind of a free for all. And I, don't, I did not feel at all, at all, in, uh, in with, after this happened, that the DA's office or the Suffolk County authorities were not taking this seriously. They were taking it very, very seriously. Um, as to what that means for the future, is this the end of racism, I don't, you know, I don't know. Who knows? I doubt it. Yeah. Fortunately. Merto Ojito, please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.